Hey guys, so this video is going to be over enzymes. And as you already know, enzymes are proteins, so they fall under that macromolecule umbrella of being a protein. But they're so special and they do so many things that we really do kind of have to treat them separately. So that's what this video is about. Let's jump right into it. So if you have hydrogen gas and you have oxygen gas and you try to smush them together, technically it should make water. But it doesn't matter what form you do it in, they're not going to combine. You could put it in your hands, you could put it in equipment, you could put it under pressure. They're just not going to combine into water. In order for these, these two gases to produce a liquid, in this case water, they need to have some kind of energy. So if you added a spark to that scenario, so you have your gases and you have a spark and they're in a contained environment, boom, you have water. Now the reason you need that spark is that spark is going to provide energy. What the energy is going to do is it's going to disrupt the bonds in hydrogen and oxygen, freeing up the electrons that will need to form covalent bonds so that water can be made. But without the energy to do so, you'll never have water made. So why do we care? Well, when we're talking about just making water, that process will cost us about 58 kilocalories per mole of water that we create. That's pretty high. That's a pretty high energy cost. And some of the reactions that your body goes through will require even more energy than that. So that means that all the food that you eat would be burnt up almost instantly if we had to provide all of the energy needed for every single reaction to take place on a minute-by-minute, day-by-day basis. Luckily, because of enzymes, we don't always have to do that. Okay, so before a reaction can happen, you need energy to break the bonds in the reactants, so what you're starting with. And those bonds have to be broken so that the parts and pieces can rearrange themselves to form the products, what you want to end with. The energy needed to do that, the energy needed to break those bonds, would, is called activation energy or the energy of activation. So if you look at the graph, here are reactants, here are our products. This is the amount of energy that we have to get our reactants up to so that those bonds can be disrupted before they will rearrange themselves to produce the products that we want. So this is our activation energy on an energy graph, on a free energy graph. You might want to like draw this. So this is where having enzymes becomes very, very effective and very useful. Because for some of the reactions that your body goes through every single day, it requires a lot of input of energy. And if we had to commit all of it just to having chemical reactions take place, we would, like I said, burn all our food up almost instantaneously because we'd constantly be taking the energy that our food supplies and putting it straight into our chemical reactions. But enzymes prevent us from having to do that, at least all the time. So let's talk about what an enzyme is. We know that it falls under the umbrella category of a protein. But really what it is, it's a biological catalyst. And it is a catalyst that has the ability to increase the rate of reaction or the speed of biochemical reactions. Enzymes tend to be made of proteins. Some of them can be made of RNA. And they're also very, very specific. They're, they're very picky about what they will and will not work with. They'll only work with a certain set of reactants. Those reactants are called substrates. And the substrates must fit within a binding site within the enzyme called an active site. Okay, 
So another good thing about enzymes is because they're biological catalysts, they can be used over and over and over again. Now, they do have a certain lifespan, but using an enzyme once will not completely destroy it. It won't actually for a while it won't destroy it at all. So they can be used over the same enzyme can be used over and over again. It makes the process really, really efficient. When an enzyme binds with a substrate, the substrate is going to fit into or interact with a very special part of the enzyme called its active site. This binding of the substrate to the active site causes the enzyme to undergo a conformational change, so it changes its shape, pretty much pulling the substrate closer into the active site. This is called induce fit. So if you look at the picture for me, oops, hold on. All right, so the little red dots, those represent your substrate. The big blue bulging thing, that's your enzyme. If you look right in the middle, there's a very defined shape, a shape that the substrate will definitely fit into, and this is called, this is your active site. So when the substrate gets into the active site, look at how the picture changes. The two sections of the enzyme surrounding the active site almost close in on the substrate, pretty much like it's giving the substrate a hug. And this is called induced fit. When we first discovered enzymes years and years ago, scientists thought that instead of doing an induced fit, that enzymes and substrates fit together in a method called lock and key. So there is a very specific shape of the, of the active site, and the substrate had to have that exact shape to be able to work with that enzyme. Now we know that's not entirely true. Even though enzymes will reject substrates because they don't fit into their active site, they really do conform around the substrate, really pulling it in tightly, allowing them to do their job. <clears throat> All right, here's another picture of it. The purple section is the enzyme. This is the enzyme ribonuclease, and the green part is its substrate, in this case, RNA. Rib now, you're going to learn that nucleases are sniffing enzymes, so ribonuclease's job is to break RNA apart, to decompose RNA so that it can be reused or recycled. If you look at it, the purple section pretty much seems to be wound and clinging to the green section. So it's really pulling its substrate into its active site and holding it there actively. Again, this is just an example of induced fit. <clears throat> so how, does it, how exactly are enzymes going to speed up these reaction rates? Well, what they do is they lower the amount of activation energy. They reduce the amount of energy you need initially to start the reaction so that it's easier to get to that point. Think of it this way. DSW has these gorgeous boots on sale. Sorry, no, they're not on sale yet. DSW has these gorgeous boots. They cost 50 bucks. And it is the middle of the month, and I don't have an extra $50, but I really want those boots. But the chances of me getting $50 before those boots are all gone, are slim to none. So I probably won't ever get my boots. But if DSW ran a sale, let's say it's a 50% off sale, now the boots are $25, and that's much more attainable. Like I could probably get $25 faster than I could get $50. So now I'll be able to buy my boots. It's the same situation with your energy, your activation energy for your reaction. Normally you need this much energy to get this reaction to go you would have to put in a lot of the energy you're taking from your food to make this reaction happen. So this is very costly. If I add an enzyme to the equation, it lowers the amount of energy I need to about this region right here, which your body can probably do a whole lot easier, thereby starting the reaction off a lot faster. So we get all the energy we need, and then we make our products. So it's literally a change in the amount of energy that you need to have the reaction go. That's how enzymes speed up reactions. They lower the energy needed for activation. So here's another picture just pretty much showing the same thing. The purple blobby thing, that's the 
enzyme. And then the little green hexagons or whatever those are, that's your substrate. In this case, this is the substrate sucrose. So, excuse me, let's start on this end of the picture. They probably want us to start over here, which is fine, but I like to start on this end. Look at the shape of the active site. Now, keep in mind that enzymes do induced fit. So with that being said, would this sucrose molecule fit into this active site? Yes, it would. So sucrose is probably a good substrate for this particular enzyme. This enzyme, by the way, is called sucrase. Here's a little hint about enzymes. They tend to be named for either the job they do or the substrates they work on. So sucrase is the enzyme that works on sucrose. So here comes my substrate. It's going to fit itself into the active site, and the enzyme is going to conform around it. When the enzyme and the substrate come together, they form what we call the ESC, or the Enzyme Substrate Complex. You probably want to draw all of this, or at least write it out really well. So that's normally step one. Step one is my substrate binds to my enzyme, and it creates the enzyme substrate complex. Now, it depends on what this enzyme is going to do. This particular enzyme's job is to break sucrose up into its two component parts, glucose and fructose. For it to truly make glucose, neutral glucose, and neutral fructose, water needs to be added in. Now, remember you learned about how monomers are made. They're made through the process of dehydration synthesis or the condensation reaction. That's how the bond is formed. We take water out to form the bond. To break the bond, we do the opposite. We put water in. So this would be the process of hydrolysis happening right here. Okay. So we put water in. Water is going to break that bond, but one of the reasons the bond is going to break is because this enzyme is going to put pressure, like literally push on and distort the bond in the area that you want it to break. Once the bond has, bro has been broken, the enzyme is going to open up, so it's going to relax its active site, and the glucose, the newly made glucose molecule and fructose molecule, which are your products, are going to be released. Once those products clear the binding site, this enzyme is once more activated and can bind a new substrate. And this process just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again, which is why we say that enzymes are biological catalysts which don't get consumed by their reactions. So the reaction took place, it's all done, and now we're going to use the same enzyme again to do the same process all over. So initially, if we could graph the rate of reaction when we put an enzyme in, one of the first things you're going to notice on your plot is that the first couple minutes is going to be a very steep slope. It's going to really increase really, really rapidly. So, and that's kind of a fact. The, um, the rate of your reaction, once you have an enzyme present, is always going to be fastest at the beginning. This is known as initial velocity. The question is, why is it so quick? Well, here's what you have to think about. Hopefully you remember what kinetics are from chemistry. It's just like Brahmian motion, movement of atoms. So you know that everything naturally moves. Even our enzymes and the substrates that they work on naturally move around. So what's happening is you have your enzyme, right? So you have several of them. And you have the substrates that they work on. Now all of them are going to be in motion. They're all moving around. But when you initially put them into your beaker or your test tube or wherever this reaction is taking place, they're going to just move until they collide with each other. And when they collide with each other, your substrate will enter the active site of your enzyme. So when you first put the substrates and the enzymes together, you've made no products yet. 
So the chances of an actual substrate reaching an enzyme is, I mean, that's all that, it, that's all that can happen because that's the only thing present in your environment. Now, after a while, when, um, when the reaction has been going for a bit, you're going to start having products as well as your substrates and your enzymes. So that's going to slow down the rate of your reaction because now your products, I'm just going to make these bigger so that we can tell the difference between the products and the reactants. So now sometimes instead of bouncing into its substrate right away, the enzyme might bump into a product. Well, that's not going to fit into its active site, so it's going to keep moving. It might bump into another product. It might bump into several products before it finally collides with the substrate and the reaction takes place. So that's why this region of your graph, things are starting to slow down. And then here, they're, they're more or less stopped. I mean, sometimes you do have increases, but for the most part, your graph is going to plateau because either every enzyme's active site is currently full, or they're trying to make their way to the substrates that they're going to be working on. So this is why you see this particular type of graph. Okay, so when we, st now we can play around with enzymes in several ways. We can increase enzyme concentration and keep substrate concentration at a minimum, at, you know, a, at a constant, not a minimum, but at a constant. And of course, that's going to make your reaction happen really quickly because every enzyme will be occupied, at least initially. We can also increase substrate concentration and keep enzyme concentration at a constant. You will also still initially see a large increase because, again, every enzyme's active site will have substrate in it just because there are more chances of bouncing into the substrate than anything else. But eventually, you will have this plateau, this slowing down first, and then this plateauing effect because we're going to start using all of our substrate up. And there are going to be times in the reaction where every single enzyme is already working on a substrate, so thus it can't fit more than one at a time. The reaction itself slows down. Now, other than increasing enzymes, and substrate concentration, we can increase temperature, and we're also going to see a change in reaction rates. Every enzyme has what we call an optimum temperature, or optimum T. That is the temperature at which it works the best. For most of our human enzymes, that's going to be about 37 degrees, because our body temperature is about 37 degrees. You go too far past 37, and the rate of reaction is going to slow down, and eventually it might even stop. Um, too far in front of 37, and the rate of reaction is going to be starting up. So it'll start off pretty fast, hit where it's at its optimum, where you know we're, we're quickly binding enzymes to substrates, and then you go past that, we're going to slow down. Organisms that are extremophiles, like thermophiles, for example, but those bacteria that live in you know, like geysers or underwater volcanoes, places that it's really, really hot. Their enzymes are going to be much more heat-stable and heat-resistant than ours are. Their optimum temperature is probably going to be somewhere around that 75 range because that's the kind of environment that they live in. So through natural selection, yeah, we're bringing back our evolution, they're going to be more prone towards having enzymes that are heat-stable. So what's the effect of temperature on enzymes? Initially, as you're building up, your reaction is going to take place very, fairly quickly. Once you hit your optimum temperature, this is where your enzyme is going to work its best. If you go too far beyond that optimum temperature, you're going to start seeing a decrease. Why do we see this decrease right here and right here? Well, keep in mind that enzymes are proteins. Keep in mind that for the most part, proteins are held together by hydrogen bonds, which we know are weak. You increase the temperature, you distort those bonds, they can't hold anymore, and the protein denatures or unfolds. If it unfolds, it's going to lose the structure of its active site, then it can't do its job anymore. Remember our favorite saying, 
structure and function. They go hand in hand. Okay, so now let's talk about pH. So we talked about enzyme concentration. We've talked about substrate concentration. We've talked about temperature. pH, <clears throat> excuse me, can have very similar effects. Just like how you have an optimum temperature, you're going to have an optimum pH. That optimum pH is really going to depend on the type of enzyme, what it works on, where it's found, and what organism that enzyme is found in. So here is the pH graph for two different enzymes. This is pepsin and this is trypsin. Now they both both of them digest proteins, but they're found in two very different places. Pepsin is found in your stomach. Trypsin is found in your small intestine. Yes, there's still a little bit of digestion taking place in your small intestine. You know that from about here to about here, we're acidic. And from here to about here, we're basic. So seeing as how pepsin is found in your stomach, where we have things like hydrochloric acid, which makes that area very acidic, it makes sense that pepsin's optimum pH is only about a 2. It works best in acidic conditions because it's found in your stomach. Unlike trypsin, which is found in your small intestine, which is more alkaline in nature, it's more basic in nature, so it makes sense that trypsin's optimum pH is about an 8, where it's more of a basic situation than it is an acidic situation. Just like with our optimum temperature, we're going to have that initial increase as we get closer to our optimum. And then once we get past our optimum, we're going to have a decrease, just like we did with temperature. Again, it's because the pH is going to disrupt those hydrogen bonds once you get too far past your optimum. Once those bonds are disrupted, the protein will denature, because remember, enzymes are proteins, so they'll unfold. If they unfold, they lose the shape of their active site. Their substrates can no longer bind. <clears throat> okay, so now we know about enzymes and we understand how they work. But let's talk about things that can affect how your enzyme works. So if something affects your enzyme, it is going to affect your rate of reaction. So within your cells, you're going to have molecules that are called enzyme inhibitors. And mostly these are chemicals that inhibit or stop the action of an enzyme. And they come in a couple of forms. So let's start by talking about competitive inhibitors. So just like the name suggests, there is going to be competition between this inhibitor and the substrate that this enzyme normally works with. Let's look at our pictures real quick. So here you'd notice that the substrate has a very definitive pattern, just like the active site, and obviously these two will fit together quite well. But look at our competitive inhibitor. It doesn't look exactly like our substrate, but it's close enough that it could probably fool the enzyme. So a competitive inhibitor is literally going to compete with the actual substrate for the active site of that enzyme. It's going to get in there and it's going to block the enzyme. Sorry, it's going to block the enzyme's active site. And once that happens, the substrate can't bind to the active site anymore until the enzyme realizes that it's been fooled and it gets rid of the competitive inhibitor. This is definitely going to slow down your reaction rate because once this guy is in here, this enzyme can't actually function on its substrate, so it's not actually doing its job. Now, the more competitive inhibitors you have, the more enzymes you have being shut down, the slower the rate of reaction is going to be overall. Okay. So other than your competitive inhibitor, you have a non-competitive inhibitor. Like the name suggests, this one is not going to compete with the substrate for the active site. It doesn't look anything like the substrate. But instead, what it's going to do is it's going to bind to a site away from the active site. So it's going to bind itself to another region of that enzyme. When it binds, Look at how it changes the shape 
of that active site. Now this enzyme can't fit in here anymore. It cannot force its way in. So ultimately, it's still shut down. This enzyme can't work. So, and here's the other problem. The enzyme can't really get rid of this non-competitive inhibitor. So once this guy is in place, this active site is, is down, and this enzyme isn't working. So again, it's going to slow down your rate of reaction. The big thing being it changes the shape of your active site. So let's go over that again. With competitive inhibition, the competitive inhibitor looks very similar to the substrate. It is going to bind in the active site and block the active site from the substrate. With non-competitive inhib inhibition, the inhibitor looks nothing like the substrate. It binds at a place away from the active site, but once it's bound to the enzyme, it causes it to change the shape of its active site so that the substrate still cannot bind. Again, the result is going to be a slowed down reaction rate. Okay, now along with being inhibited, we have enzyme, our enzymes can be regulated because there are going to be times when your body doesn't want your enzymes constantly speeding up reactions. So the ways that your enzymes can be regulated is through a process called allosteric regulation. Allosteric comes from a Greek root, which means away from. So allosteric regulation is regulation by changing the structure of a molecule. In this case, we're talking about changing the structure of our enzyme. It works on enzymes that have two or more polypeptide chains. Each polypeptide chain is going to have its own individual active site. Because these enzymes exist in, it's a big molecule and it has multiple chains, each chain has its own active site, it has two shape-like conformations. So an activated conformation, so one shape when it's activated, and a non-activated conformation, so a different shape when it's not activated. Another term we can use is functional active site versus non-functional active site. So the um so you have to imagine a molecule that has four, you know, two, three, four parts. Think of hemoglobin, because this would be a good example of an enzyme that will do exactly this process. Along with having its normal active sites, these molecules will also have a place for the binding of one of two chemicals. One called an activator, which is going to turn the enzyme on. It's going to put it in that functional active site position. And an inhibitor, one that will turn the enzyme off. It will turn it, it'll put it in that non-functional active site position. So let's look at the picture really quick. Um, this is what the enzyme looks like when it's activated. Look at all of its active sites are pointed outwards and they're all open. They're ready to receive their substrates. This is the activated form or the functional form. This is what the enzyme looks like when it's inactive. So they're all kind of curled up. They've changed the shape of their active sites. They're not as open to substrates as they were before. So this is the difference. This is activated and this is inactivated or functional and non-functional. So when the activator binds, it stabilizes the entire enzyme, allowing it to stay in its activated site. But notice the activator binds at a site away from the active site. So it binds at what we call an allosteric binding site. It's not taking up any of these active sites. Okay, so it's bound someplace else. If the activator isn't there and the inhibitor instead has bound, is bound to the enzyme, notice how the active sites change shape so they can no longer work with their designated um, substrates. Again, the inhibitor is also going to bind not at the active site, but at a site away from it called the allosteric site, but it prevents the molecule, or the enzyme in this case, from being activated. It can't bind to anything. So the activator is going to stabilize the 
functional active site position, the inhibitor is going to stabilize the non-functional active site position. So when your body really wants to produce something, it's going to send its activator in. When it doesn't want any more of that particular substance being produced, it'll send its inhibitor in. It'll shut down the enzyme. So this one turns the enzyme on. This one turns the enzyme off. That's one way you can think about it. Okay. So why would we ever not want our enzymes working? And how do we how do we get to the point where we can get all of these messages like hey enzyme work, hey enzyme don't work? Well, enzymes work through a process called a feedback loop. And one of the ways that you can shut them down is through something called feedback inhibition. So, when you work with a series of enzymes in a biochemical pathway, which just means that we're doing some kind of metabolism, we're breaking something down or we're making something, usually you'll have several individual enzymes and they're all only responsible for one part of that chemical reaction. So you have this big chemical pathway that might be made up of six different steps, but you'll have five enzymes that are responsible for one part of that actual pathway, one small reaction in the entire big reaction. Now, if anything were to happen to any of these enzymes, we're not going to make a product, and it's going to be a product needed to make the next product and the next product and the next product until you get to what you're trying to form. So let's look at our picture. Here we have threonine, which is one of the amino acids. And we're trying to take threonine, and through a series of changes, we're going to make it into another amino acid called isoleucine. It is a six-step pathway, and there are five enzymes, all of whom are responsible for doing one section of that chemical pathway. So enzyme one is going to catalyze step one. It's going to make a product that enzyme two is going to take and turn into to another product, which enzyme 3 is going to take and turn into a product, and it keeps going until you get to isoleucine. Now, your body is not big on, let me make lots and lots of this because, because I, never, I don't know when I'm going to make more or I might run out. Because then once you've made a whole bunch of it, you have to store it. Your body's not big on storing extras. It kind of believes in making what you need, and then if you need more, guess what? You just make more. So when we have enough isoleucine in our system and we don't need to make any more, isoleucine is going to become an allosteric inhibitor. It is going to go up to whatever that first enzyme is. It is going to bind away from its active site, changing the shape of its active site, and now we no longer do this pathway because we've made enough of our product. The pathway has been shut down by the product it's actually designed to make. This only happens once we have sufficient. If we need more, this process is going to keep going. Once we've made enough, this guy becomes the inhibitor of its own pathway and shuts it down. When it's time to make more, it unbinds and the process starts all over again. The last thing that I want to talk about under the umbrella of enzymes is the, the function of corporativity. Again, another good example for an, um, sorry, for an enzyme that's going to do this would be, or for a protein, sorry, that will do this is hemoglobin. So corporativity happens when you have two or more subunits to an enzyme, and again, they each have to have their own active site. What happens is, when a substrate bonds to one active site, it pretty much changes the conformation of all the other active sites, making it easier for their substrates to bind to them. So in a big molecule like hemoglobin, if you remember, I showed you what hemoglobin looks like. It has four subunits. Each subunit is going to bind a molecule of oxygen. So let's pretend that this is oxygen. When oxygen binds to that first region of hemoglobin, the rest of them get turned on. So they get switched to their on position. And because they're in that on position, and because this substrate is stabilizing this form of the enzyme, it's much easier for other oxygen molecules to come in 
and bind to this enzyme. So it makes the enzymes a whole lot more efficient than if you just had to bind one substrate, you know, and then hopefully bind another and then hopefully bind another. By changing its conformation, you make it easier for other substrates to bind. All right, so that is it for enzymes. Um, hope it wasn't too, too rough on you. So we have one more video for um, biochemistry, and it's going to be over Gibbs free energy. This one might be a little rough, but we'll do the best we can. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.